there comes a time, and we hope it isn't once a summer, but there comes a time in a camp director's life on which crises compound on each other. And we want to talk today about how we deal with that. Hello, Camp Mavericks, and welcome to the Camp, Camp Hacker Podcast. I am Travis Allison. I'm grateful to have you here. I am a summer camp marketing and strategy consultant, and I help camps translate what they do so more families insist on sending their children to summer camp. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Hudson. I am a social worker and the camp director at Camp Highlight, which is an incredible summer camp for children who have LGBTQ families. And my name is Gabrielle Rail, and I'm one of the camp directors of Camp Oro. Camp Oro is an all-girls camp in the Laurentian Mountains of Quebec, and we try to focus on creating a positive female community, and we do that while speaking in French and English. And my name is Joe Richards. I'm a summer camp professional who has chosen to ply his wares at Pierce Williams Summer Camp and Retreat Facility as the executive director for the past 15 years. Uh, we are a United Church of Canada summer camp and retreat facility located in southwestern Ontario, about halfway between Detroit and Toronto. Welcome back, you three. Uh, interesting topic today. Uh, I'm sure we've all had these days. Uh, as I say, um, you hope that this doesn't happen every summer. Uh, I would say over my 15 years of camp directing, this is probably in every three summers, there would be a week of just one thing after another whether it was um, helicopter evalu evacuations from out trips or, uh, you know, compounded with lots of uh, other things happening on site. And of course, the health inspector showing up while I'm on the parents on the parent mm -hmm. call with that camper's parents. Um, I, we've all had those times and they are incredibly hard to deal with. And so um, I'm sure we will start, share, share some stories, but um, I really fo want to focus on how we handle those. Um, and I think the most important part is that we anticipate those ahead of time and put some things in place to make sure that we can handle those as best possible. Um, I think, um, yeah, lots of stories. There have definitely been many moments like those for, for us when we were camp directing. Um, and um, and, and I'll start off by saying that I think it was my experience is easier than lots. Um, although the panelists all have great partners in camp directing, um, it was nice to have two directors at, at the same position, um, myself and Beth, where um, we could either be dealing with two crises, uh, eat one each, or um, if one crisis was upsetting, more upsetting to the other person, one person or the other, you could switch off. Um, and I definitely remember uh, a moment specifically with a board member where I just had to walk away and say, I'm, I'm sorry, you have to take this one. I can't, I can't be the one to handle this one. Um, and there were many times when I said, it's okay, I got this one, just go. Um, and that was certainly a, a gift that, that we had in co-directing. But uh, I think that that was our, our major crisis thing was that um, it, it was helpful to have somebody else that we trusted to make good decisions with about this. So I'm wondering for you, what are the sort of things that you would, you want to put in place ahead of time that you you think are great survival skills for, for lack of a better term in, in a big crisis? Honestly, I didn't hear anything you said after helicopter evacuation. You, no. There was a helicopter evacuation? <laughs> For a cardiac problem with a camper. I mean, I think the entire episode should be about that. No, I'm and kidding. To tell you the truth, Chris, <laughs> it's not the only camper helicopter evacu evacuation that I have been around responsible I, for I reacting you, to. If we ever had to evacuate someone by helicopter, Camp Highlight would be the most popular camp in the world. Like if these kids knew <laughs> that there was a chance they can get a helicopter, uh, <laughs> I'm joking, but not by much. Um, I, I, first off, I think when it comes to emergency pre preparedness, you have to, I feel like I say this all the time, but you really have to understand what you, like your core values are. Like for us, it's just like, keep the children safe at all costs. Keep the children safe at all costs. So whatever we have to do, however much money we have to spend, whatever we have to pull or whoever we have to push or pull to make that happen, 
just make it happen. And in, in some cases, it makes things not easy. It's never easy, but it makes things very clear about what has to happen next. Um, the first year that we did Camp Highlight, which was 2000, uh, oh my God, cut this out. I don't remember. 2000, oh God, I'm going to guess 2010, uh, 2009. So, anyway, so when we started Camp Highlight, there was a, a storm bearing down on New York City where a lot of the kids had come from. And it was going to arrive the, the day of departure. So we had to get all the kids home the day before, and we were running transportation. And that was, it was, I mean, it was a crisis for us because we were just starting out. Also, I want to point out that week there was an earthquake. So pretty much we were just being tested. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, we're like, well, there's a storm coming. We have to keep the kids safe. So what do we do? We just got to get the buses here today. Like we're just going to call them and tell them they just have to come today. And whatever they tell us, whatever they tell us that we have to do to make that happen, we're just going to do it. Um, it wasn't easy. It wasn't cheap. But uh, it was clear. And the clarity was really helpful to me in the crisis. Like it's just there's only one thing to do. Yeah, I think that clarity is is key. I think that steps we can put in place to be ready for it is just our our mindset, right? And and um, the idea of what they now call a growth mindset, right, where you are sort of ready for anything and you can do anything, um, <clears throat> right? That that when something happens, you will have the skills to deal with it. Um, Every, I said it just the other day as I was um, <laughs> with my maintenance guys were, was moving uh, commercial dehumidifiers into a flooded basement. I said, every moment of my life has led me to this point so that I have the skills to deal with this quickly and efficiently and, and get it done. And um, I think that that's the way, the best way for camp directors to approach things is to is to say, great, every every everything that happens is an opportunity to learn, right? And everything that happens is an opportunity to learn and to and to use into the future. And I think that mindset, I I wrote down on um, on my sheet of notes as we start a podcast. Don't be fooled into thinking that I write this down like well before the podcast. It's literally during. <laughs> Gab knows how well I prepare for things. I literally wrote down mindset, 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 right? Because if you think that the world is coming to an end and and you think that you're not going to be able to handle it, then my belief is that you are not going to be, <laughs> to be able to handle it. And you what yeah, you are what you believe and if you if that's what you say to yourself. It's a, self-talk is the most important uh thing for for this topic and also for many other topics <laughs> so yeah and that comes with with having a strong team you know with what Travis was talking about at the very beginning if if you if you want to start point start with building trust within your team start with involving them in in all of the procedures um that are necessary and and you don't have to involve your your young staff members, but certainly your leadership team members need to be able to step in. If you know how, when do you make this the call to call a helicopter evacuation? When do et cetera, et cetera? And I think also um, desensitizing your staff to to the fact that you know stuff does happen every summer, and and share previous summer the this is what we had to deal with, and then another summer this is what we had to deal with, so that it's not a shock to their system when something does happen like a basement you know flooding or a huge windstorm that knocks down a bunch of trees and you have to clean up after that storm um, there's you know there there's a that's part of the behind the scenes so letting people know that when stuff happens at camp that's part of our norm um, but how we deal with it is this is how we deal with it and so then you also have that mindset that you can trust your that team to step up when you, when you need them to step up. So you're, you're clear headed because you know, you're not by yourself making decisions and by yourself executing plans. Um, Cause you can't do all of it at the same time. Uh, 
I'm watching Chris's thinking face to see if he has something thinking. specific. I mean, you mentioned helicopters again, which is so distracting. Can we stop talking about the helicopter vacuum? Because it sounds cooler than it does. It sounds more cool than it does Chris dire. Chris wants to go on a helicopter. I want to go on a helicopter. Uh, yeah, that's different than a helicopter evacuation. I, I suppose. Wanting to go in a helicopter and Still, dealing with the crap that comes with having a helicopter land as you're on evacuating, yes. As you're evacuating the kid, there's got to be a moment where you're like, this sucks, but it's also you're gonna run and jump and grab on to the onto the side <laughs> as the rest of the camp explodes. Okay, we're way off topic. Listen, I was this Gab, I was listening to you about you were saying um when working with the young staff, like desensitizing them to the fact that things happen. I guess the question I had was, does that work? Because I, I don't think I've been able to do that successfully working in camp for okay. this long. It seems like the young people are always excitable and and I've given up trying to desensitize to them. And just I've just taught them how to um, triage and escalate. <laughs> so, I mean, when you said that, does that work? Are you able to yeah. sit the young people down and just be like, look, sometimes kid, you know, you're gonna get hit by like arterial spray from a kid. And when it does, you just calmly exactly find the right. wound. Yeah. Do you do that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think the, I mean, does it work? Yes and no. I think it works in the sense that the 17 year olds that I've spoken to now that they're 19, they've evolved into, into being able to process that. So they might not have, like you said, the excitable part that might, that's going to be the learning piece when after the event happens, then you can address that behavior afterwards and say, you know, is there a different way that we could have dealt with this, et cetera, et cetera. So then when they are 19, it's just, like it's, it's that, um, it's the puzzle pieces that you're putting together. So they might not have that exact reaction that you want them to have at 17, but by the time they're 19, they're part of that that they, this is not new to them anymore. And they've had those experiences. So it's setting up the expectation. And then it's also giving them clear, um, you know, direction. So in an emergency situation, like you said, the triage, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. So, you know, like forming that uh, um, privacy shield around somebody that's injured, you know, giving them those tasks, but yes, talking to them and, and saying like, I'm, I'm sharing, what happens and this is what's normal at camp is that we deal with people and and there's incidences that can happen when we deal with people and we deal with a physical site and there's incidences that happen and we're the problem solvers and the ways to deal with this is x y and z and then afterwards we're going to debrief but there will be incidences and most likely there, most likely there's going to be an incident this summer and this is what's helpful when we're dealing with an incident and then you're of course going to have um, staff members that react not the way we want to. But I think my interpretation sometimes is from, and this is where Joe is talking about the mindset. Sometimes I think my staff could react better. And I think that's because I'm, I'm hypercritical. And after the summer, and when I debrief it with people that I trust and know me very well, I notice it's only one or two or three staff members that reacted the way I didn't want, but the other 65 were fantastic and great. And I didn't even have to pay attention. So mm -hmm. also it's my mindset. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I am, I'm like, why didn't they react this way? But actually it was only two or three of them, those pains in the butts, but you know, <laughs> those ones, <laughs> they learn though along the way. But what you said is really important, Gab, the fact that we're probably going to have an incident this summer. And that goes, I was on a, a Dr. G uh, webcast a couple of weeks ago. And she okay. said, when talking about coronavirus specifically, she said, use when, not if language, right? So yes. when coronavirus comes to camp, this is what we're going to do. And, exactly. and what I said to my camp director is I said, I think, I think we go through our policy manual and just change it all to when language. Right. When, yeah. you know, when this illness happens or when, when this happens, this is what we do, because I think that helps with people's perception when they're reading through the staff manual and expectations um, for and sure. expectations. Like right. Oh, and, right. and it sucks because I just, as I was saying that I thought about the, the death or the death closets in our staff manual. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a, like when a camper dies, this is, these are the steps to follow. Um, but, and, and I think that, when, when we're talking about what we're talking about today, which is this idea of when everything seems to happen at once, the more clearly you can follow a set of pre-written instructions, at least if that's your framework, right? Then, then you're gonna be more successful. There are times when a storm comes out of nowhere, a literal storm, 
and there are sailboats flipping off the dock and there are canoes flipping off the dock. And at that moment in time, there's no real script for that. Um, and I just find, my, right, that's a different, uh, you know, there's sudden crises and there's crises you can see coming and some you, yeah. the way you prepare for them, like even at camp, here at Pierce Williams, and I've talked about it on the podcast before, the 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 um, de uh, the detour, departure, or death, right? So when you're when you have someone at camp who's a, an integral part of camp, um, right? If they get really sick, so if you had an administrator who's been with you for years who got really sick, that's a detour because you don't know what their job is. So are we ready for that detour, or are we ready for that person's departure mm -hmm. if they're going to leave camp? Or if somebody dies, right, are we ready? So, so it's all a similar thing. And um, it goes to the fact that when every, when all of this is going on, and Travis, I'd love to know if the, if the, uh, I'll bring up the helicopter again, just to get Chris squirreling. Come on. Um, <laughs> when our policy here is when some, when no matter how bad things are, camp goes on, Right. Like, because for 90% of the campers, camp has to go on. And if they never know that a kid got picked up in a helicopter, that is totally fine, right? If they uh -huh. never know that you had an ambulance on site, that is totally fine because the program went on, the staff did their job. You can debrief it with staff later, but it's unimportant that, it's unimportant that everyone knows everything. And I think that's where a lot of camp staff are like, well, you didn't tell us this. And I was like, well, that's not, you don't need to know. It's a need to know basis. And I didn't feel like yeah. it was important for you to complete your task. All right. Mm -hmm. it, one of the things that, that, um, the, the gap say made me thinking about things like, I guess, and you were reinforcing this, Joe, that we need to create as many procedures as possible. I think it is worth talking to you other camps, other camp pros to say, what are the worst crises you've ever faced? Let us make a plan for that. Um, there have been a number of major incidents at camps in Ontario across the world that have affected the whole industry. Um, but part of that is that it allows some of the rest of us to plan for those kind of things. And there was a, a an incident in the 90s that meant that our camp, that not our incident, um, but that another camp had that meant that we created um, massive um, crisis protocols and ha just having that. And, and the idea that there is a checklist or a guideline to follow, um, I think depending, I mean, you have to know yourself in these situations. I love emergencies. That's yep. why I was a firefighter for seven years because mm -hmm. I, I want to be in the middle of all that all of the time. Um, but other people, that's not the case. It's incredibly hard to handle. Certainly, you have to build in a plan that needs to be built today for how you debrief these situations, how you talk to your staff about it, how you talk to your campers, as Joe talked about, what they talked about, and parents. And because it's 2021, you probably need a plan to start to talk to, be prepared that if your staff's parents call, how you're going to deal with that. Because it's that didn't used to happen. That happens more often these days. But even in a situation where you have a plan, you're going through it. If you're stepping up, you're 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 dealing with. You need to be prepared to deal with media. You need to be prepared to deal with all these different yes. groups to communicate with. It is great to have someone right behind you with that checklist on a board, for whom you can say, "Okay, where are we at? What do I need to be remembering right now?" Um, so that the the remembering everything. You get, to, you get to be the calm problem solver in this, but you can't probably match that with the remember absolutely everything. And so if you have someone who's behind you with a clipboard, who's like, okay, next step is this. And then you've already taken a positive step to dealing with a crisis uh, effectively and you know, reducing crisis. Go Chris. What's really critical about that is having it written down, like having 100%. it written down and having it accessible. Listen, I'll tell you something staff training, that part of the manual, nobody reads it. Like nobody reads it. Like what to do in event of a storm, what to do with lost child. Like, cause we, we have like pop quizzes, not really, but we like, we have discussions and it's so clear that the staff just gets that part stops and then skips to the appendix. 
And I, I don't know what to do about that. We've tried all sorts of things in training. Um, and it's not that things don't happen. It's just that I guess the strength of what I'm trying to say is that I feel really good that when things do happen, they have the manuals in the cabin. You know, mm -hmm. it's not committed to memory. It's not like, oh, one more thing. You need to remember this. Like, no, we write it all out. And I think that's really important to have that out and accessible for your staff, especially your young staff, which, you know, again, Gab, we need to talk because like clearly I'm not training these young people well because <laughs> they're, they're liable to freak out at any moment. Um, man, if my I staff is it. listening to this, you know, <laughs> not like freak out, but like, especially the ones who are like, this is their first or second year. It's sort of, yeah. you know, they could be thrown by a really bad bout of homesickness and they run to yeah. find us. And I, I, you know, um, and having it written down <laughs> is super helpful. I find. Well, I, I, I that's interesting. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> how long is, how long is highlight usually Chris? Like how long are uh, it's a week? Just, yeah. It's so it, yeah. it, it, that does make a difference when you have staff yeah. for longer periods of time because mm -hmm. you get to build, but you have people who are coming year after year. And so you can build that culture of capable mm -hmm. into your staff and kids. And, and I find over time that the staff just becomes more capable if you had, you know, all the usual set high expectations, make work with them on the things, recognize that people's psychology is always changing, will definitely be much different in 2021 and 2022. But um, you can definitely work on how to, to get staff to be, you know, mm -hmm. in a situation where you have an, enough staff anyway, who could step up and say, what do you need? And the dirty little secret is the more crises, the better they get at it. Of course. Like I've been at, yeah. I've, yep. I've worked at six weeks camps for years yeah. and it was, yeah. Like the first time a kid throws up, it's like, what do I do? The fourth time the kid throws up in week five, you're like, all right, you grab the bucket. You're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. The experience helps. First but time a kid pulls a knife on you, it's yeah. challenging. That's when you hit the button. The second or third time you're like, this is getting kind in. of funny. You jump for the helicopter, you're out of there. <laughs> Um, so I guess, I guess I keep bringing this up, but that's what I was, I, that's where I was going with Gab when I asked before, cause I find like experience is really the best teacher. The explanations mm -hmm. almost never work. I've never been, ex I've never been in a situation where the explanation worked. Cause like we talk about yeah. storms all the time. And the first time we have the storm, the first year people freak the heck out. Yeah. yeah. So I think, then they I don't, think the for second me, time. Yeah, I think from you're right. I think for me, it's it's not just the explanation, but it's the explanation paired with the experience, paired with the the reflection, and that that loop has to happen. The reflection piece must happen, and then sometimes you need a reminder in between seasons, um, and say, oh, remember last year when we dealt with that, you know, homesick or home lonely camper, and your reaction, and they quickly usually properly say oh yeah and say okay so how are we going to address this this year what you know and and usually because we did the reflection piece throughout the year that beautiful subconscious subconscious mulls it over and they are more they are more prepared um but you're right just saying it without any follow through the lesson is lost you're, i would agree with you on that one for sure but i also think chris that <clears throat> what gab is talking about in training staff and what you're talking about in staff being um, overreacting, <laughs> freaking out is something that our, that our friend Mark Cooper and I talk about a lot is this idea that calm is contagious, right? So if in a crisis, you as a director are calm. So when a storm, I have distinct memories of being on, on the island of Wapameo, um, in Algonquin Park during a storm. And, and my thing is I just become hyper-focused during an emergency. That's just mm -hmm. the way my, my mind focuses, and so when I tell you to go do something, I, you know, where in a normal time, I might not say it quite in that, that uh, tone of voice or whatnot. That is not the moment to say, well, that hurt my feelings. At that moment in time, I don't care about your feelings. I care about solving the problem. At the end, when we debrief, I'll apologize for making you feel that way and walk you through <laughs> that you shouldn't feel that way in that particular moment but this idea that calm is contagious that when when something big happens people will look to you it's like you're you're training dogs right that if you're i'm not i'm not oh, saying dear. we are yeah i know but but, I think you're but this is a perfect thing if, if you 
if when you're training your dog, your dog looks to you to see how to react to, to different situations. And camp counselors are are the same way. They look to their their leaders to how to react to a situation. And if you can do it calmly and competently, mm -hmm. then they will learn from that. They might not need mm -hmm. to remember what's in the manual um, at that moment in time, because you're going to remember what's in the manual mm -hmm. um, and help them through that. But um, I find if I just get a microphone and talk really low and talk to them, it just calms them all down. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that, that that's a good, there's some, there's gold in that, Joe, because we cannot, we're not going to hire people who've had these kind of experiences before. Any of these things, like just the, the, you know, the closeness of the community at the end of the camp session when everybody's just melting because it's so heart-wrenching to leave this close community they like we can't prepare them for that we we have to give them a chance to practice and we have to tell them what the expectations are but but we have to understand that they don't have any reference for this level of stress in the case of this topic and so we have to be as patient as we can but there's certainly been situations where i have said to a staff member that's it you're out mm -hmm. come back in an hour mm -hmm. like yeah. don't talk to anybody i don't want to see you for an hour we yes. will keep working with this whenever you're ready, but not when you're ready. When not when you think you're ready. Come back in one hour, take that time and get ready, and then we'll go. Just because I can't handle you while I'm handling this, because as Joe said yes. from the beginning, we're here to make kids safe. And um, if yeah, so. absolutely. And also, in turn, kids are looking at their counselors, which right. is why, like, no matter what happens Darn right. in camp, I'm just like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, and it doesn't matter what you say. I'm just always yep. like, okay, all right. Yep. You know, and, <laughs> and calm is contagious and that's what we try and give to the counselors, but I, they really have to see it. Um, I, I, in my experience, they really have to see it to be able to do it if they care. Um, yeah, you know. for sure. Yeah. You look like you had a thought cap. No, I'm just taking okay. it all in. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, I would like just one piece of personal advice for camp director in your shoes, not just sort of the, the camp culture and the camp planning. So like, what is a person to do? What's some good advice for a person to do? Um, I'll give you, I'll give you some time to think about it. Well, I, well, I start with a couple of things. Um, one, never under, underestimate the value of 10 seconds of sitting still and breathing um, before things that has changes so many things changes your capability changes what you put out into the world in that situation um and most of the other stuff I've, we've we've put in there but one other thing that i did a long time ago um and and i don't know if this is still the case at, at the camp that we used to direct but um we had emergency numbers by every phone and um included on those emergency numbers were three camp directors within one hour of us that I considered friends. Um, that if there was some sort of crisis, I could have called Brother Bill and said, Bill, we got something going on. Can I talk it through with you? Or can you know, can you send me six bodies for a day? Um, any of those things. But there was people that I had, um, you know, jerky, this is what's going on. I just need someone to bounce it off of that. Having that handy and not having to look that up in a crisis. Of course, when I camp directed, I didn't keep, there weren't cell phones to keep in my pocket all the time. Um, and so it, that was a little different, but I think even in that situation, you would want friendly numbers close to every phone so that you would have someone to reach out to. Some other sort of personal pieces of advice that you would give. I think you mentioned this before, and this isn't something that we can easily do, but like, um, I'm a co-director of Camp Highlight. There's two directors. You mentioned that before. It's so great to have someone else to calm you down or to also reflect back to you. Is that an emergency? You know, like just so that there's that. And I know a lot of people listening, you can't be like, well, I can't just hire a new, if you, if there's just one camp director, it might seem like I just can't hire a second one, but you know what? Maybe you can. Maybe you can. It's something to think about. It makes the job way easier. Um, the other thing that I was thinking was, I think it's really important to define emergency. Like what is an emergency? 
for you and your camp? I know we talk a lot because of a couple of cases that have happened. We talk a lot about what to do when a camper dies. And like starting there when you're doing your crisis unit in training can be such a bum note. And I, I just, when you're, when you're talking about that with staff, I would just say to warm up to that, depending on what your camp culture is, there's different kinds of emergencies. For us, bullying is an emergency. The whole camp shuts down. Everyone knows it's happening. There's whispers. Everyone's pulling to the director's cabin. It's a really big deal, which also means that everyone takes it super, super seriously. So like if, if running around the pool is your emergency and you make, you know, you, you set off all five alarms when that happens, then that's, in some ways, it's really instructive for the staff and the kids. Like, define what an emergency is for your camp and your culture. I really like that, Chris. Because um, um, you're also talking about your camp values. And you're also talking about how to approach things. Like, if you're you know running around the pool is dangerous, so we take that seriously. But how do we deal with that situation? Because it, it hasn't gotten to the point of, harm, but it could lead to that. So I, I appreciate that. Um, just be, just before we start recording, we were talking about, you know, the differences between like the, the big crises and the, as well as just like the, the straw that breaks the, the camel's back. And then sometimes it feels like the camel's just on the ground and it just straws just keep going on the poor camel. And he's just saying like enough already, I'm already on the ground. And I, and I think that happens that can happen to a lot of camp directors where, where it just feels like things are piling on, piling on. And it's not like the, the sailboats that are, you know, being thrown everywhere by wind and you take care of it and nobody got hurt. And you can sort of feel proud afterwards. You know, we dealt with that and let's look at how we anchor down our boats in the future type situation. Um, but where there's, there's just things after things that are happening and you just can't handle it anymore. And I, I honestly think, and we're talking a lot about support systems, but I honestly think that um, camp directors need a strong support system and not just when crises happen, but throughout your the, the summer or whatever your season might be. And a lot of the times we reach out when it's at that boiling point, when it's at the, the, the breaking point. And to have specific times that are set up weekly to just check in with somebody that's outside of your camp circle um, that doesn't put any pressure on them that you can just talk things through. It's probably going to take some of those straws off of those off of the camel's back and some of the things might go into a pile of I need to deal with but it's okay and then others will be prioritized. But regularly chatting with somebody that understands you that understands the seriousness of your job, not just somebody that you know they need to get what you do as a camp director because it's it's serious stuff and it's serious uh, pressure. Um, and keeping up with those conversations, I find that for me has been uh, essential in keeping a clear head and, and making good decisions instead of rash decisions. I think in the moment, what I would say, or just before the moment that you need this, what I would say to someone is <clears throat> act confident. The last thing you need yes. Is, yes, yes. For, is for someone to question whether you think you're right or wrong. And this comes out in a variety of ways. I still have this distinct memory of my CIT coordinator, Dave Haskell, saying to us, act enthusiastic and you shall be enthusiastic, right? As young 14 and 15 year olds and act confident and you will be confident in an emergency. You are, this is what you're paid for. <laughs> this is what, no matter how much or how little you're paid, this is your moment to shine. Be confident. Mm -hmm. It's not the moment to worry how someone's going to perceive you. Are, are they going to like me after this? You can, it is, you can blame it on this situation, right? If, if, if somebody's that petty, it's the same thing right now. You can blame everything on COVID when it happens at camp. Um, but you need to act if you need to act confident in that moment and be sure of yourself, you can question yourself after. And that's what all great leaders do. You question yourself after so that you review what happened. You debrief it by your, I know I do this. I debrief it by myself in my mind. Like what was that situation? Could I have done something different? Did I cause any additional harm? Um, right? Like th these are the things that I go over in my own head. I don't debrief them with, you know, if you have a spouse or a partner that you can debrief them with, that's awesome. 
um, and is hugely beneficial or another camp friend, but in the moment or just before the moment, the words I want you to hear ringing in your head are act confident. I love that. I, I 1000% sign on to that because, you know, especially for our youngest staff, I've intimated this to them. I don't know if I've said it this way, but like, you know what, maybe you can't find the solution. I'm not, you're not here to solution. You're just here to, to make the kids comfortable until you can escalate it. So if you yeah. just act confident and calm, that's fine. Even if you don't know what to do, it doesn't matter. It's 1000% true. Correct. That is such a good place to put a pin in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of thank you, we want to thank Ultra Camp for their sponsorship of the Camp Hacker podcast. Do you remember why you got into camping in the first place? Why you put yourself in a situation where crises could stack on top of each other? Sometimes all of the busy work associated with running camp keeps us from seeing why we're here. Ultra Camp helps you get back to what you love and understand why you are at camp. So what does this mean? Ultra Camp, having them in your corner means that you have powerful tools to automate your billing, simplifying your registration process, managing your hiring process, including integrated background checks built into the software and communicating with your custom, customers and or your donors if you have those. So exclusive to Camp Hacker listeners, for a limited time offer, the Ultra Camp folks have a free setup for folks coming through listening to the Camp Hacker podcast. So they say, if this sounds too good to be true, let us talk. They'd love to show you a future where you can finally have time to get back to what's really important, working with kids at camp. So please visit our website, summercampsoftware.com slash camphacker and set up a, a time to chat with them. They look forward to meeting you. So that means that we are now on to our tool of the week. So uh, if you're drawn in by our snappy podcast title and you haven't been listening to Camp Hacker before, the tool of the week is where we ask everybody to come on the panel to come with a tool that makes them a better camp director. And uh, I'd like to start with you, Joe, this time, please. Awesome. My tool of the week is a library card get it Bingo. and learn how to use it. You don't even need to go to the library nowadays. The reason this came up is um, I live in a location where I actually have two library cards, three if I really wanted them, the city of St. Thomas, but the city of London also gives me a library card um, because I'm part of the St. Thomas Elgin. Anyway, on the London, I can I can get free subscription to the New York Times. I have to renew it every three days, but it's a free subscription to the New York Times, right? I also have access to 3,600 magazines published around the world through their magazine app. I also have access to, you know, thousands of newspapers. I'm a San Antonio Spurs fan, in case you didn't know. And um, so I read the San Antonio <laughs> Express from... Um, from my new tablet, I just, I, and I didn't buy an iPad. I ended up buying a, a, a Samsung tablet at Costco. Um, and it's great because the magazines on my phone weren't big enough, but on the tablet, they're super awesome and makes me use the library more. Um, and, and, uh, there's another, uh, podcaster and, and the creator of cool tools, Kevin Kelly recently talked about canopy, which is a, a free service to watch stream things and to listen to all of the great courses. Guess who has a full subscription to that? My library, get a library card, use it online. It's super amazing. Kevin Kelly, former camp hacker podcast guest when he was promoting his last book. Sweet. Yeah, so you can look back and find, listen to Kevin and I talk about, um, managing parent expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you got? Um, I have AnyList. Um, AnyList is an app that you can use on your iPhone or your Android. Um, and basically, I love this thing because you can create your own list. They have template lists for like grocery shopping or home improvements or whatever. But what's really awesome about it is A, it's free. B, um, you can share that list with anybody if they download the app. 
the app. Yes, Travis, you've got it. It's so amazing. So, and so just, if you're like me and, um, you know, whoever comes says, I'm going to the store, do you need anything? No, I don't need anything. And then when they're at the store, you're like, oh, wait, I need five things. And instead of sending it just to them on their text and they get a random text, 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 you can actually just update the list that they already have, which I think is fantastic. You can also import um, different recipes. And also if the person's like, I don't want to, I don't want to nap on my phone. No problem. You can just text them the entire list and boom, and it's organized by aisle. Oh, stop it. It's so good. It's and organized so by and store would be great for town runs for camp. Oh, exactly. So I, I just started using it in the past month. And exactly the point is that for this summer, imagine like that person that's going to the town, doing that town run, everything organized by store, by aisle, like boom, boom, boom. Like how cool is that? And then for those last minute. Yeah, I love it. It's, it, Chris, it's going to change your life. And I think okay. it's actually going to save a lot of couple relationships. Right okay. I think in, in the coupleness of people, I think this is going to lessen some tensions. <laughs> I'm going to download it right now, actually. Why waste time? So interesting, right. interesting fact, and I wanted you to get your user spiel out of the way. My friend, Laura Tyson's their marketing director. Huh. <laughs> great job yeah. i love yeah. i don't i i couldn't believe that i didn't i haven't i didn't discover it before yeah because it's such a pain in the butt writing lists are such a pain yep. it's awesome yeah it's also easy to it's not easy it is possible to set it up through your smart speaker to be the list like you know amazon has their list and google has their list thing built in but you can any list is set up so amazon Apple and Google through their smart speakers, you can just add something to your list and it goes on your any list. Hmm. I think it's going to be a game changer for the summer, but yeah. And right I think now, the other awesome. the other piece about that is that you can log in through your browser. So if you have someone who's in town with phone with the thing and anybody's just got their computer open, they can add stuff to the, whoever yeah. you're, the person in charge of setting up your town run list can just add to their list. I like that remote piece that you're talking about, Gap. It's really fun. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I have a tool um, that is probably on the edge of the nerdiest thing I have ever featured on Camp Hacker. And in 11 now, almost 12 years, that's pretty much saying something. Um, I have been talking to Chris Hudson about designing a game um, to teach counselors how to, to, get, to let counselors practice how to um, engage with kids because of my um, rediscovering my love of role-playing games. And um, so we're talking about how can we create a game that, that camps can use to, to train their staff because there's so much emotional um, knowledge gained from role-playing games and great leadership opportunities, et cetera. So um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that I have a handful of pretty dice with lots of colors. Um, they are called the Genesis dice. They're also known as the narrative dice system. So system being the way that you play a role-playing game. Everybody knows of, of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the world's biggest role-playing game, but there are literally thousands of role-playing games. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's an underlying system that's common and there are different settings. So I don't want to get too far into that. But anyway, what I found interesting about this set, this Genesis narrative dice system, is that in a game like Dungeons and Dragons that you've seen on popular culture, if you haven't played it before, there's a situation, the person who's leading the game will say, okay, you need to roll this number to succeed. And then they will tell you what die to use. And so you roll a, a, a 20 sided dice, we call it a D20. And if you're over that number, you, you're successful. If you're under it, you are fail that thing that you wanted to do. The interesting thing about this set of dice is that you can fail something and still have positive outcome, or you can massively succeed and still have some negative consequences. So mm -hmm. it's not just pass or fail. Um, and you That's can... Cool. Based on the skills you developed, you can you know have greater chances of positives, but there's still always a chance that something catastrophic can happen. It's pretty low. Um, so 
in a situation you're like, okay, you just rolled, you have succeeded in this thing you want to do. In the camp world, you wanted to jump over that creek with your campers. You succeeded in it, but you have two failures. So you succeed in jumping over the creek, but um, the camp phone falls out of your backpack and falls in the creek or the walkie-talkie that you were given for this day trip oh, wow. and falls in your backpack. So it's not just, yeah, you make it over the creek. It's like, no, there's something bad happens too. And then you get creative about what that is. So I love it for that reason, because um, it has some cool possibilities of making people think creatively. Role-playing games in the end are just chances for people to get together and tell stories. Um, but I'm really interested in the work of the Genesis Dice because it helps you build the story. It helps you imagine that this is a total success, but there's a little minor thing that happens. And so you get to creatively work on a minor negative effect or et cetera. So. That is so cool. That was I'm, so nerdy. I love it. I know. It was very I nerdy. It. <laughs> it was so cool. I just saw Star Wars role-playing dice. It's, it's, it's the Genesis, the Genesis system. It's, That's exactly what I'm talking about. Star Wars, the Star Wars is the game. Genesis system. Yeah. Netrunner does. There's a lot of settings. Yeah. I, I, I know. There's a D, the fantasy thing. The, um, and then I know they're going to have an Arkham one any second. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're going to yeah. have a horror one. Yeah. It's a big system. They invested a lot of money in that. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. not a, it's such a great idea for um for staff training it's so amazing mm-hmm. and, and the fact that you might do everything right but there still could be a negative outcome or you take risks and there's positive outcome i think yep. that is real life that's so cool <laughs> yeah i love that i really really love that that's so neat well gab if, if anybody's listening and wants to support this very small seed of an idea that I have shared with Chris and, and a couple of other camp directors. Um, we could use some financial backing, of course, in which case we would hire Gab to do the graphics for um, <laughs> our, our version of the camp counselor game. The Chris, what's yours? Are endless. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're anything like me, over the past 12 months, you've been in approximately 400 billion Zoom calls and meetings. And not for nothing, I'm bored. So I was super excited (laughs) to discover gather.town. That's right, gather.town is the web address. And what it is, it's a new way of video conferencing. You log on, you quickly create an avatar, and then you're launched into a virtual world, uh, a clubhouse, if you will. Like it could be a clubhouse, it could be by the beach, it could be an office. And the other people in that world, you can interact with them. As your avatar gets closer to their avatar, their video and sound comes into sharper focus. So it gives you the idea, uh, it gives you the sensation of sort of like mingling with a bunch of people. Uh, we, I've been testing this out with my staff, trying to figure out how to make it work, how to build community with our campers over the, over the summer, I'm sorry, during the year. And you know we're just now trying to chart the possibilities. It's such a simple idea but it allows people to interact in a way that's a little bit more natural. What's more is what I really enjoy about it is that we're all familiar with Zoom breakout rooms. And you know, when you're in the other room, like you're in the other room and it's up to the person who's leading to pull you back or shove you back out. You know, in Gather, if some people are just gathered in the virtual backyard and you're like, oh wait, let me check in with the other group that's in the kitchen. You just walk over and be like, hey everyone, we're done in the backyard. Like let's mix the groups up and uh, like I said, I'm not, I don't know if the possibilities are endless because I'm still working on it, but I encourage everyone to take a look at it at the very least, at the very least, you know, just jazz up the meetings you're having with your friends. You know, it's, it'd be so much, I know there's a lot of zoom happy hours that were happening. This would be the perfect thing for that, but I really do want to challenge everyone who's listening to find a way to use it with your campers and your staff and your parents. We're going to have our parents get together on Gather, and we're discussing doing all of staff training through Gather. So check it out and let me know what you think, positive and negative. Staff training. Yes, mm. I'm. I'm very excited. We can talk about that offline because I can. We record ideas. a ga- Like, could we do a podcast on Gather? So I'm not. It's still in beta. <laughs> so I'm not certain that it records. It share screen. It you can share your screen. You can do a lot of things that you could normally do with Zoom or Google Meets. But the recording is not something that I think they are. Because if I could, yet. I would just wander to a hammock and lay down. Yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you'd you'd wander to or the scroll saw. Scroll saw. Yeah, just... it's come up again. 
This, this is the Joe's workshop room, Sweet. and it's very loud. <laughs> but you can make things with fine detail. My mic gain is way too high. <laughs> oh, you three. Gab, um, I know that you had a student who is has a plan for, for Gather. Is there anything extra that, that she thought of? This is a student in your designing staff training class. Is there anything extra that she had thought of that, oh. that you would add to that? But she had planned yeah. her whole staff training already. She did, yeah, she's developed um, different rooms and uh, different topics for the rooms. And as Chris said, you can move from one room to another. And as you move away from, from one room, those people become more silent. Um, but like Chris, she's still working on it and she's, she's tried it out and the, the feedback is very positive. And I think um, I'm not somebody that plays video, video games very much. Um, I'm a Mario Kart pretty much only video game player. Um, so when I first saw it, I wasn't quite, I, I as somebody that um, doesn't really understand this type of platform, I, I wasn't quite sure how to use it, but I did go on and I was like, this is actually quite simple. And if you're looking at, at shaking things up, this is a really cool way of doing it. So um, I, I, I think, again, it's looking at possibilities. Like what are the possibilities mm -hmm. that you can do and just not be too intimidated by it? But Chris, did you find it complicated? No, it's really not. And I've yeah. been, I've been yeah. running it through with groups of friends because I, I want there to be no barrier to entry. Because especially if we do with the parents, like we right. want to have no barrier of entry. And there really isn't. You send someone a link, you pick yeah. an avatar, hair color, skin color, shirt, uh, you do a quick 30 second tutorial and then you're launched into the world. And it's just very, it's very simple. You don't have to be a video game person. You just have to know how to go up, down, left, right. And it just, it makes an intuitive kind of sense. And I find it's the experience that you really want on video calling to be able mm -hmm. to take sure. a break. You can take a break and go away. You know what I mean? You could be like, all right, I'm just going to wander away from this. I'm going to go do something else. And just not having to look at people or you being looked at physically. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really totally. Nice. You know, just that in itself saying this is, we don't, we don't need that part of the screen for the moment, I think is, it's just, it's giving options. And yeah, I, I'm really excited about seeing what people are going to do with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Me too. I've been designing workspaces and a camp clubhouse. I've been designing a camp clubhouse for the past two weeks, still learning, looking at all the YouTube videos, how to build a space. You can program some of the items in there, like you can put games tables in there and people can gather around a table and it will launch a game that you two can play. You can, um, I think you can watch videos together. I could go on and on, but just everyone just, just check it out. And listen, <laughs> caveat, it's been a long year of technology and every second it feels like there's something new that's being foisted on the public. Like, try this, try this, try this, try this. There really is very little barrier to entry here. And, and you'll be happy for it. You're not going to hate it, right. if anything. It may not move you, but you're certainly not going to hate it. So check it out, gather.town. Right. Excellent. Well, um, that means it's time for me to remind you that the show notes from this episode can be found on camphacker.tv slash podcast, um, where you can find this episode and the links to our tools and all of our previous episodes as well. So I want to thank the three of you for being here with me today um, and talking through your crisis management skills. Uh, if people want to follow up with you, Chris, how do they get in touch? It's easy. Just go to Instagram and search at Planet Chris One. Uh, look at my amusing pictures from around New York City and send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. Interested in Camp Highlight? That's also easy. Go to at Camp Highlight on Instagram or find us www.camphighlight.com or email me at chris at camphighlight.com. My phone number, no, I'm kidding. That's for Joe. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Thanks, Chris, for being here. Gap. Uh, you can check out where I work at waro.com, O-U-A-R-E-A-U.com. You can email me at info at waro.com. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Gabrielle Rail, and Rail takes two L's. Thanks, Gab. Thanks. Joe. You can send me an email, joe at campisbetter.com. And Chris, nobody's ever called 519-636-4285. I, I just don't think it'll happen. Everyone, please call Joe. <laughs> Everyone who can hear this, just take the time. Call him, say hello. Compliment Tell him you're a Camp Hacker listener fan. Yep. Yeah, just <laughs> call Go for him. it. And if you want to mail me socks, feel free. 
<laughs> <laughs> but they not not yeah. There's rules about what kinds of socks. No pizza slices. That would that would be bad. Right. There we go. Everybody's got their boundaries, Joe. I'm glad you stayed yours. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad. I want to thank everybody for watching us on YouTube or listening while you're doing fun things. We appreciate being a part of your lives. If you have any questions or things you want us to talk about or even feedback uh, or ideas for specific episodes like this, please reach out to Travis at gocamp.pro. Thanks for the evening, friends. Thank you.